switch off the lights on this side? Good morning, everyone. I'm Bargo, and this is my colleague uh, Ragotam. Uh, we are here to give a talk about uh, what a data analytics platform is and how we should use Python to build a data analytics platform and, and things surrounding that. Uh, so, we keep hearing words about platforms, so we thought it's a nice uh, place to introduce a new term and uh, get started from there. Um, so uh, a data pla platform is something which offers to solve a uh, business problem, one specific problem across various domains. Uh, so you would ask, this, isn't this what technology is supposed to do, isn't this what everyone does, so what's, what's really uh, something new here? But like uh, what uh, you would generally see that technology has been around for a long time solving various problems, uh, not necessarily have a specific business problem. So uh, the data science is a very, very overloaded term. Uh, it gets very, very abused for various things. Uh, this is yet another thing take on us. So, so our uh, our take here is that it solves one specific use case. Uh, an example is uh, if you want to solve attrition. So, the different kinds of attrition for different kinds of domains. So, if you are in the telecom industry, you would you would want to know who would leave your service provider and move on to someone else. Uh, or you would want if you want to sell insurance. You would want to know who would buy your insurance product next. So you would you would want to have an engine which can do this particular stuff. Uh, most of the times, what happens is people build it in the house, all the big corporates. But more often than not, if you are in a startup space and you want to do something, you would want to do something like this, where you build one particular stuff and you go and. Uh, plug it in various places. Uh, this is different from just pure technology. So if you're just doing, say, just a Python solution or Hadoop offering, big data offering, uh, it varies in the sense that here there is a strong amount of domain expertise. So domain, when I mean domain, it's not to do with a uh, specific insurance vertical or a telecom vertical, but rather to do with a business case within that particular way. So attrition is one particular thing. So if, you, if you've done marketing before, there's various things that goes on in marketing. So you want to know who are the leads, who would buy the products. Uh, now if you want to do fraud detection, almost every particular uh, domain would need to figure out how to do handle fraud. So these are, these are things which gets plugged into various applications. Uh, so, uh, before we get this, this is a puzzle for you guys. Uh, so there are two, two huntsmen, they go hunting and uh, each one of them can, can hit a target with a probability of 0.2 and they see like 150 birds in a tree. Uh, the first huntsman takes uh, a gun and he fires three shots. Now the second guy goes, oh come on, I can do that. He fires shots at the tree. So now, how many birds did the second huntsman shoot? No, all of them flew away. Yeah. So, 
I don't have a chocolate here, but that's right. So they, they all flew away, right? So uh, if you so so one thing that you would so the thing is all all the technology offers is to do you do things in a very very intricate level uh, that you would get so deep into technology stack and. Uh, uh, we will talk a bit about, a lot about machine learning very soon, but uh, you would get so much involved into the particular stuff that you would lose the big picture. So you you, uh, you could pretty much come up with the probability computation here, but when you actually know that that's, that's bullshit, right? So that's not going to happen. So they were, uh, they all following. So, uh, so, so the key point here is always keep the big picture in mind. Uh, want to do a startup, want to do a consulting offering, do any of those things that comes in data science because data science is, uh, is generally a horizontal offering which is offered across the entire business spectrum. Uh, so just just so that you keep in mind. Uh, now, so now, now that we've identified what a data platform definition is, what all things go into data platform? So there's uh, there's a huge chunk you need to do data addition. You have data from different formats, you have CSV files, uh, you have it in some mainframe systems, you have it in, uh, you have to process streaming data uh, or in databases. You, you can have it in all sorts of places. Uh, this, what you would do from the data is you would clean it, you would do some processing, uh, then you would take and build models. When you do models, it, it may not necessarily be a statistical model. We will talk about what all things can happen very soon. But uh, these are things that you have that you do, and then you present it to a client in, in a dashboard. So this is what uh, the structure of a data platform would be. So if you're going to do a cross-sell application for a marketing uh, campaign, then you would you would take all sort of stuff. Uh, and then do data integration, claim, processing, modeling, dashboard. And that can be done for cross sell for insurance, cross sell for high tech retail companies, cross sell for car manufacturers. They, they, all, they all need the same stuff. Uh, this, is, this is generally a flow that happens. Uh, Python fits very well to all these things, but is it really used in production for all of those things? For, for a lot of things, yes, but for some of those things, no. So the early part of this process is, is all Python DB because you would want to do prototyping, you want to do some quick uh, demonstration of your capabilities. Uh, not so much when it comes to dashboarding. Uh, I mean, there are people here who would have to, oh, there's Simon, there's Boca, and all those stuff. The, the, uh, the thing is, those all would help for you guys to for an analyst to learn, but um, it still doesn't scale well for a production setup. Um, it's still very, very early. Um, um, so now we talk about data platform over here, about stuff, but what are the different kinds of output that can come from a particular data platform? It can broadly be categorized by this, we call this like dipstick index. Um, so we talk with more about what that is. Uh, D stands for descriptive analytics. So uh, you, when, you, when you do when you do some things here, some of the things the model uh, you don't need to build a complicated machine learning model. You would uh, you would just be fine just summarizing the data and visualizing it. So you just want people just want to see the plots or just mean, median. That itself would 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 give you what uh, you want to take. Uh, the next step, uh, so this descriptive generally answers this question about what happened. Uh, so next step when something like this happens is why did this happen? So um, some examples of this would be A-B testing. Uh, a common example that happens is you have two different offerings and you want to know which offering is better than the other and uh, the data science way to do it is to actually do an experiment with people, uh, do a test control setup, gather information from uh, uh, from the trial 
and then see if your product, which product performed better. And then, uh, so for example, if you look into um, Google or Facebook, they're really, really heavy on uh, on EV testing and Twitter. So these are things very, very heavy on uh, the color, the shade of color that you see, the green, the blue that you see. Uh, there's so many shades that they have tried so many people and they've figured out that this is the color which attracts most number of users. Uh, I mean, so it can be as trivial as what border your, uh, your Twitter logo should be. Uh, that's something that's come from data. Uh, these are done, so the tools, I mean, I use the tools over here. So here, uh, NumPy and Pandas are, are the tools. Seaborn is a tool which is built on top of Matplotlib. Uh, Matplotlib is very verbose. It's, uh, um, I mean, if you're used to it, then okay, but if you're starting, that's not a good tool to start with. Seaborn is a wrapper around Matplotlib. Uh, and it's, it's, it comes with really nice defaults. Um, that's uh, that's really good. Uh, Inquisitive. So the two dominant things here are just SciPy and Stacks model. Uh, they help you do a whole lot of statistical analysis over here. Um, uh, for example, Titus is what you do to do um, AD testing. Um, the three, uh, the third part is where uh, machine learning fits in. So you want to predict something from from we have some data, so you want to predict something from uh, from that, and that's uh, that's predictive analytics. So um, uh, this is considered uh, people really consider it to be sexy, but this is just one part of the entire problem. Uh, so um, if you ask me, do you build models for all the possible stuff? Mostly not. Sometimes you would just get away with being descriptive and. Uh, Inquisitive. Uh, it, it happens when you have a lot of data. Your application really demands a predictive model be built. Then you go ahead and build. Uh, Scikit Learn is the Python module for for building machine learning. Uh, by that, that's the most widely used machine learning library around. Uh, as long as there are no R users here, so uh, that's uh, that's really uh, you know, extremely popular. Uh, uh, it, it's been around for a few years, it's been around for lesser time than what R has been around, but uh, the kind of stuff that you can do with that is so phenomenal. Uh, the fourth P is the prescriptive part. So when you can get what happened, why did this happen, predictive answers, what will happen. So it's going to tell. But then you need to know what's in it for me. So you are going to tell that, okay, so uh, something's going to happen, so what should I do? So the, uh, and my stock is going to get hit by 20%, so how should I act? Uh, so machines can't really answer this. You need to really have human in the loop. Uh, this is a place where uh, uh, humans really uh, play a central picture. Uh, so a data scientist is someone who can take all this data and, and can actually make recommendations based on this. Uh, so you do A/B testing. You build who's going to use a fraud. Uh, uh, is it just a fraud transaction or not? So you need to know and create what your business logic is. Uh, data scientist does this one too. Uh, just to summarize this step. Uh, so we, we talked about okay, this is building better machine learning algorithms, right? So I've set the stage about how. Uh, uh, so so the reason why I talked about data platform here is that. Generally, a productized offering is always better than an individual uh, service offering, and there's been a whole lot of movement towards productized offerings. Uh, and one critical part there is predictive modeling. The problem with predictive models is that as data scales, as your complexity scales, uh, your the kind of models that you fit would would entirely differ. We all know that different kinds of data can have tiny data. Uh, so you would, you would generally go to Stack Overflow, you will say, I have a tiny data problem. So that's like a very uh, common thing these days. Um, so uh, medium tractable data is what uh, most people deal with. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why that's the case. Uh, big data are things which only uh, very, very few companies deal with. Uh, so one of the reasons is big data has its own definition and these days you can get like 
one terabyte of RAM. I have 500 GB of RAM machine. So it's it's very, uh, that's not really big data. So you can do everything within RAM now. Uh, so what kind of predictive models would you build if you have a small data? Uh, you would generally build an extremely simple naive model. Um, that's because um, there's something called Occam's Razor. Anyone here aware of what Occam's Razor is? Okay, so a couple of them. That's good. So it just means that uh, you, should, you should look up. So there's some interesting uh, discussions about what that is. Uh, it, it talks about uh, uh, a simplistic version is always better than a complex feature. So uh, that tries to. So one of the things that machine learning tries to do, it's just a machine learning thought process in science is that people assume uh, whether you believe in God or not that there is some God given equation which generates the data and the aim is to find what that equation is. Uh, that's what all machine learning tries to do. Uh, the, the problem there is that you can try to make it as complex as possible or as simple as possible but if you try to build a very complex model for a small data Eventually, what you're doing is you're memorizing what is there, and uh, when you actually run it on uh, new po data points, because you've memorized on something that's existing, you wouldn't really do well. Uh, the machine learning term for this is called overfitting. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be really able to do something better than uh, uh, just because you've built a very complex model. Uh, so that's what Occam's Razor tells. Uh, so medium tractable data is anything which is like less than one terabyte size, has a lot of information is where uh, you would use and uh, scikit learn really does come to our help. Uh, that's by far the most dominant use case. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of libraries that's uh, one cool thing is it has some very really standard features uh, about the way it does. It doesn't really have all the state of art things that's going on in the academics, but for industry, if you want to use, uh, it's, it has pretty much everything that's needed. Um, that's one of the things that you would hear in language wars between R and Python telling that oh, R has all everything because a lot of academics use and things are there, but uh, it's not as intuitive and easy to use as scikit learn. And it, it, this has really good interface. Uh, two important things that I want to talk about, which people really don't talk about when using Scikit Learn, is this concept of pipeline and future union. Uh, so, in, in machine learning, it's the same process, right? Where you have, uh, we talked about this uh, a data flow in a data platform, you have data ingestion, data processing, data pre processing, then modeling. So, all these things can be created can be formed as a pipeline, uh, the code would look something like this. For example, if you're going to do a sentiment analysis using Twitter, uh, you can uh, you can write a function which is extracts tweet, you can do count. Um, this is a way to extract features from it. It's called term frequency, inverse document frequency. It's a very really, uh, popular way to do uh, transformations. And then you would build some predictive model around it. Uh, so from whatever I have worked around, uh, this is the only thing which offers capabilities like this, where you can chain your, this is like your Unix pipe stuff, right? So you take output of your previous thing as, as the input for your next stage, and the entire data flow can be uh, fitted into a, a particular pipeline. Uh, sometimes the only challenge here is that maybe uh, because it goes sequentially, you would probably want to build features in parallel. You want to exploit multi-core options, and that's where feature union comes into picture. Uh, it does exactly the same thing, so you can have multiple pipelines going together. Uh, this is an example where you would have uh, feature union doing three things together. One is doing some ingram stuff. The other is finding what the length of the Twitter is, and also finding a function which does spelling. And once everything gets done, it goes into the next stage of the pipeline. So you can have, you can chain pipeline to a pipeline. Uh, it gives you tremendous flexibilities. 
no, no. Feature Engineer lets you do things in parallel. Uh, uh, so you, you would want to see why these things are done because in machine learning most of the applications require the entire data to be done and that's the way the algorithms are defined. And there are very few algorithms which can be distributed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you would want to exploit uh, multi-core facilities in, in other processors rather than much later in the uh, step. This is a very big challenge that uh, it's got nothing to do with Python, but generally a good problem that you have is if you're building a predictive model, uh, do you want more accuracy or an explainable model? So uh, your manager might want to tell, no, understand, your management wants to understand what the drivers are, how you go about doing it. Is that more important or do you really want a very, very accurate model? Uh, the use cases differ, so if you want to use real accurate models, uh, these are things that you would use. These are these two are considered currently state of art. Uh, deep learning, uh, you all heard about it. We did a tutorial on that two days back. Uh, the other thing is ensemble models. So uh, I'm not going to cover deep learning here. We have questions. We can take it the question the session. Uh, so an example of where accuracy is more important is uh, things like, okay, so you want, you have, you've taken fingerprints and you want to categorize someone as a terrorist or not. So then accuracy is more important. You don't care if you want to understand what goes on behind it or not. But uh, just understanding the features of that is much more important. So recognition then is much more important than the explainable stuff. Uh, this is to do with ensemble models. Uh, it's a little, um, we are slide, but later. there's a whole lot of stuff that you can use in Python to build ensemble models. Uh, so, a quick two line on what ensemble models are. Uh, so, you would build every model separately. So, you know, there's things like random forest, logistic regression, linear regression. Uh, the thing is to take all of them together and then build another model using it. So, use that as inputs to build another model. Uh, that's one of the, the motivating reason is it tries to explore a much larger feature space than the individual models uh, and it, it, it tends to work really well in practice. Uh, uh, so because as I told before you cannot parallelize a whole lot of machine learning algorithms this way if you do you can build multiple models. You can use your cores, your multi-core as a proxy for human intelligence. And, and build it. Otherwise, you would, you would want to do a lot of feature engineering. Uh, that, that takes a lot of time. This, these are things that, that you could use. Uh, that's what it does. That you would you would have multiple features that happens in a pipeline. You would use this as an input and build different models. So this process. So each of these steps can be parallelized. So once you have parallelized, then you 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 have you have an optimization method in in Python called hyperopt, which can assign what the weightage of the models should be. Uh, and, and rushing through a lot of points, but uh, one thing is uh, we got a book along with uh, when we registered for this PyCon. Uh, we have written an article on how to do ensemble models. So I really encourage you to read, uh, read that to understand more about what that happens. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of uh, text written about how exactly it is done in industry. So what we did is our take of how we do it. Okay, so now, but there could be other cases where people won't understand the models better than uh, because um, I don't know. Particularly in the U.S., it's it's uh, it's really important that the models are explainable if you want to do things like fraud detection because uh, you don't want to discriminate people based on age, gender, race. Uh, when you have things like that, you want to understand what exactly goes on into your model. And when you have something like that, a decision tree or a linear regression model is better. Uh, what you give away is accuracy, but what you gain back is understanding what happens and what your drivers are. Um, so a lot of regulations in the insurance industry, the banking industry would need uh, simpler models to be built because those guys don't, don't want things to understand. Uh, shift gears to big data. I'm not going to go over this volume velocity variety. So uh, the, the, the thought process in machine learning is that 
is that more data trumps better model. So you would have, you would need to have, uh, if you have more data, more data is always better, and for more data, simpler model is better. Uh, it, it runs faster. If you're going to build really uh, a complex model, uh, it's going to take years of time, so that's another problem that, that's there. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, tools and techniques about how you would do that. Uh, one of online learning, if you've here, if you've heard about it, that's that's a very common thing that happens where you take only one data point or a few data points and train. Uh, when as and when your data comes, uh, you learn. Uh, that, that's probably how all these models work: your fraud detection, uh, whatever happens in your uh, your online world. You know, examples of you know really big data. Uh, Python comes with a whole lot of interesting framework for handling uh, big data of different sizes. So big data which is slightly bigger than your RAM but still tractable. Uh, those are cases where you would use uh, Spark, Dask and Blaze. Uh, and then there are things where it's, it's really outside, it's petabytes of data, exabytes of data, then you would do something like uh, Ibis or you just use Google uh, Babbit. It does online learning. Um, so some of these things that that are done. Uh, Spark, Spark uh, Ibis, Dask, Blaze, they all do distributed stuff. Uh, Spark is in memory. Uh, Blaze also tries to do this in, in memory stuff. Dask does parallelized stuff. So uh, these are these are these are like things where uh, very active work is happening right now uh, between. So cloud data and uh, continuum analytics. These are the guys who are uh, behind uh, some of these tools. They work a lot on getting uh, relatively big data stuff to happen in Python. Uh, but just to tell, uh, as a data scientist, I don't see a comparable to any other language which supports as much as what uh, Python does for uh, various scales of data. So that's that's all I have. So I'm ready to take questions on any of this stuff. Mm, I got a technical question about when you start with that analytics. Uh, yeah. How do you start creating the models? What's what's important? In Okay, so the question is when you start a data analytics project, how do you go about doing it? Okay, so uh, okay, so the first thing that you would define, like uh, any software project, any project that you have to do is you have to define what your objective is. So you come up with a very high level definition of what you want to accomplish. Uh, the first thing that you would do is to go and figure out to accomplish this, what are the data that I need. And then you come up with a list of data sources that you need. Uh, then you go ahead and find if you can find this data. So some of the times you can find the data. Some of the data you can find. Some of the data you may not find. Uh, you may not find reasonable amount of time or reasonable amount of money. So different things that can happen. So you do the data. Next thing to do is to figure out if you. I mean, for example, the kind of problem can be. In your dict framework, right? So maybe you just want to do, you just want to visualize and show. For example, things like okay, you want to visualize census information. Now, somebody made an interesting talk yesterday about uh, uh, Great Britain's crime uh, rate and how the police works. Uh, it was a Polish talk. Uh, so uh, that's that's one of the things that that can be done to figure out what uh, what the, 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 the this descriptions, right? So you can just summarize data and, and showcase telling that uh, crime is more here, crime is less here. Or you want to do A-B testing and you already have the data, you need to predict something on that. Uh, I mean, it depends on your problem on whether it's going to follow in your in your framework. Uh, but if you want eventually dashboard and present it, um, Python is still not there. Uh, uh, there are some guys who want to disagree, uh, like Peter. So, but then uh, uh, I, I don't really want uh, Python to get better at visualizing stuff. Uh, most of the stuff that we do are visualizing D3 tiers or something like that. Uh, 
that, that, that's the way it goes. So you would, you would spend a, a lot of time just doing data cleansing work, understanding data to see if data has root layers or not, if you would want to uh, make data in the same structure. Uh, sometimes some of the things is you might want to transform the data into something. Uh, it might be in, in one format, you might want to take log of it or square root of it. I mean, uh, you, you, I mean, that's all, uh, I mean, uh, it's an art as much as science, so you, you spend time, a lot of time doing that. Uh, there's been research which tells that 80% of the time is spent on that process. You would just spend like 20% of the time building models and that 20% of the time is so efficient in my that it's, it's, I, I can't tell how much it is, it's amazingly awesome. The remaining, you can spend all your time just engineering your data and features. And, but the rest of the stuff that I talked about, pipeline and all your scikit-learn, um, other tools which are coming up, um, they're, they're really so awesome. It, it really solves it. It, it, it. it doesn't really take a lot of time to learn or implement it. Um, you were talking about the statistical analysis of data. And yeah. what the data changes over time? What if we have to get into statistics? Uh, are there any good pipeline reads for that? Uh, can you give me an example? I, I can think of many examples. I want to know what you think. Okay, so um, I have a problem. Okay. Uh, I have small data uh, that uh, pressures um, and the components of, uh, of an accelerator. And that changes over time. And I want to model that with a stochastical model. Um, and is Python good for that? Where can I find libraries for that? Data? Okay, so now, uh, okay, so, uh, okay. This is, uh, it's not a Python quiz, this is a machine learning quiz. So I'll tell you, the class of problems, you can use a class of models called Bayesian uh, modeling. Uh, Scikit-learn doesn't do that. So, uh, PyMC is the name of the uh, uh, package. So, which does uh, Bayesian modeling and, and uh, using Python. So that's a Python, that's another Python library which does that. So, so there are two classes of uh, machine learning. Uh, one is like whatever scientific learning what we will be talking about, and and there's another school of thought entirely which is called Bayesian learning, where uh, which wants to think that understanding is more important than than anything else and, and try to do something like that. So, so when you when your distribution itself changes, uh, you're better off using uh, using Bayesian models. Um, the the normal way other thing to do is to keep training your model every now and then, and associate probabilities to what when your data will change, and do something like that. So, um, it is. Um, I, I would encourage you to look into Bayesian models for that. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, deep learning, so probably if you have time to want to tell something about it. Uh, by far, the most uh, most of the non Google, Baidu, Facebook companies use Python for uh, deep learning uh, with, with what's currently there. Uh, but these companies have their own uh, versions of what deep learning uh, stuff. So uh, by far, deep learning is. Python is the most widely used language for deep learning, so they've really taken a significant lead in that. Ask questions in anything, anything to do with machine learning, data science. I've been doing it for like 12 years now. I've been doing this even before data science became a word, became a now, a buzzword. What do you find a uh, bottleneck in data analytics? Uh, where do I find a uh, bottleneck? Uh, it's a very philosophical question. Uh, not everyone believes in data. So, um, if you see, uh, there are a whole lot of companies. Uh, they say, oh yeah, okay, data tells me this, but I know my business better. So, uh, there are very few data-driven companies. I mean, I mean, whenever we talk about data, I just have to bring 
Google, Facebook, Twitter in the picture because their their culture is data driven. Uh, but there's still a whole lot of old school top companies where uh, data is not really uh, data driven culture is not central to their way of working. And uh, that that is that is the biggest bottleneck. So you can you can come up with all fancy tools and techniques, but but then if you can't actually make them take it up then, then that's really not much uh, that you can do. So I have a question about accuracy versus descriptivity. Okay. You said that you often, often sacrifice accuracy in order to make it descriptive. So uh, what if you have like a super accurate model, but when you make it descriptive, you lose a bit of accuracy. And you lose a lot of accuracy. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. like for example, management rejects it. Oh, we can't use this indication because it's mostly based on general. But what if like general indication like is the most accurate uh, model? In this case? So and you, you're asking if your simpler model is the most accurate too? Yeah, but it's like politically incorrect because it's like based on like gender and like. So I mean, uh, so uh, so some of the things are that uh, you, I, I don't know regulations in Europe, but in the US you can't use race, gender in your model at all. So you're not supposed to, uh, because there have been a lot of instances where uh, where regions which are dominated by a particular race are the crime rate is more, and the insurance so insurance is driven is driven entirely by the place where you stay, and insurance is very central to the so if you have something like that, then it's, it's really hard uh, to include race and not so. So there have been there have been other kinds of analytics which have been done. For example, uh, which is a way to come circumvent this problem. They've taken names and they've written natural language models to figure. Oh, if this is the name, then this is the race. So they've come up with. Uh, uh, it's not legal, but then that's something that the regulatory authorities come. Oh, then we cannot use names. So it's it's a very it's an ongoing battle between uh, uh, between companies and uh, regulations. But uh, that's that's something that comes, and uh, uh, it happens a lot in, in particularly an explainable model tells in a way which the management doesn't want to hear, telling that okay, if this goes down, only then you will become better. They don't want to hear that, um, but uh, that's uh, uh, if you want to do only what the management does, then uh, data analytics is not the place to be. Uh, so, so I mean, uh, just again, you know, this up in a different context. So there are companies like McKinsey, companies which does strategic consulting where uh, they don't use data. They just have all these partners who work there. They just, uh, oh, there's no one from McKinsey here. So uh, they just uh, try to figure out what, uh, where the strategy should go. And that's more based on their intuition about the market rather than, rather than data. Right. Though they would say that they use data, but that's, that's more things. Do you know of any uh, data analytics challenges? So some exercises to uh, get started working on. Ah, okay, that's a very good point. Thanks for asking. Okay, so okay, so most of us keep hearing, oh, data science, data analytics, but I want to get started. I want to get a feel of it. Uh, there are different things that can be done. Again, again, the IPB stuff. Prescriptive part, it comes only with you doing stuff for a client. So because that's human in the loops, I'm going to take it away. I'm going to solve DIP for how technology, Python, can help you do that. Uh, so for predictive models, Kaggle is a very good site. Uh, I don't know if I have I can show you. Site. So if you go here, uh, you can see a whole list of competitions. Um, they have like they have hundred thousand price. You have you have you can make. Uh, it's it's really competitive. But uh, 
You can learn a whole lot of predictive models. If you want to learn machine learning, this is a place. You can all things of data. You get like big data problems. The big like a terabyte of data. Microsoft hosted a competition with 2.5 terabyte, 2.5 terabyte of um, to make find it interesting. So they use uh, virus uh, information. So uh, with the data, by code, you want to figure out if that's virus or not. Small web classification. So some very uh, uh, interesting, really large amount of data. Uh, and this, is, this is a place where you can compete and you can figure out where you stand, how you can improve. Uh, this is one place to get started for, uh, to get to get different kinds of data and machine learning. Very interesting thing is most of the competitions here are won by Python. I think almost everything is won by Python. So uh, this is a place uh, to check. Uh, there are now similar sites that does something. For example, uh, the workshop, we did a workshop on deep learning where uh, we used uh, data from another competition called Driven Data uh, to classify uh, if uh, the picture is honeybee or bumblebee. So, uh, you can do a whole lot of stuff over here. Um, that's, uh, that's over here. Um, for inquisitive, and that's just learning statistics. Um, you can just get the data and try to do I don't see any competition, anything that happens. Um, but um, you can do this. So. If you want to read a book to see where it's applied, I really recommend Nate Silver's uh, Signal and Noise. He talks a lot about uh, how do you where data analytics is. He's the guy who predicted the the outcome of all the U.S. election states uh, has been successfully predicting for the last three elections. Um, it's called Signal and Noise. That, that's, a, that's a really good book to read. That's no good. Coursera has a lot of interesting courses, but I like to do and learn. So that's, that's just me. There's not a whole lot of Python centric courses on the course that are for machine uh, learning. I want that to change. I am not about some courses, but not for courses that are for Did you answer your question on how to learn to get started? That's it. Okay, so I'll be around here, so if you have questions, you can always ping me. Thank you, guys.